and good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to join this Insight event and meet all of you virtually today. Building on Professor Ford's insightful presentation, my talk is going to bring our focus to the other end of the age spectrum, older people. Particularly, in the next 20 minutes or so, we will look at the relationship between seeing families and friends and older people's mental health during the pandemic. While older people's physical health has afforded much attention during the pandemic, understandably, it is equally important to ask what COVID-19 has done to their mental health. Are these impacts equally felt? And going forwards, what can we learn from the pandemic? My research on COVID-19 and older people's mental health builds on my long-term research interest in gender and family relations in a global context. While a key task of a sociologist is to see, understand, and challenge the taken for granted, this had not always been easy before the pandemic. As George Orwell said, to see what's in front of one's nose, it needs a constant struggle. But the pandemic has made it a little bit easier for us as it has shaken the many taken for granted norms. And one of such norms concerns how we interact with families and friends in our everyday lives. A long tradition of research has underlined the importance of our interactions with non-cohabiting families and friends. Such interactions form the everyday fabrics that hold our society together they sustain the exchange of essential material, care, and emotional support. And according to the convoy theory, the mere company of family and friends is essential to maintaining our mental health. COVID-19 has substantially limited and reduced our face-to-face -face interactions with our family members and friends who do not live with us. When it comes to the aging population, their heightened vulnerability to COVID means that extra measures have been put in place to protect their physical health. Most of these measures focused on the household, at least at the early stage of the pandemic, as a basic unit of pandemic control. Most, if not all of us, are familiar with those measures, ranging from shielding isolation to restricted mixing between households. Older people were the priority targets of those measures. Letters and text messages have been sent by the government and GP practices to advise the elderly to stick to those measures. In the UK, older people may be particularly susceptible to those measures. Around one fifth of the UK population was aged over 65 in 2019 and according to the 2018 and 19 English housing survey, 29% of all households were led by someone aged 65 or over. And in 45% of those households, the older people lived on their own. At the same time, the pandemic has accelerated the mass digitalization across our society. As in the case now we are doing this event via Zoom, the use of uh, Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, social media, email, and texting has boomed over the past couple of years. But when it comes to older people, we know that their access to virtual means of communication is highly uneven and can be limited in many cases. And making the transition may not always be easy. As it takes efforts in multiple dimensions to build up the digital infrastructure, to afford digital devices, and to learn to use the technology. Taken together, and the social interaction of older people were doubly constrained during the pandemic. On the one hand, the in person interactions outside the household was particularly limited. And on the other hand, Compared with younger generations and digital natives, many older people are faced with greater challenges in coming to terms with virtual interactions. At the same time, we are seeing a looming mental health crisis among the aging population. Accruing evidence suggests that there has been a decline of general mental health among older people, 
And more specifically, researchers have seen an increasing level of mental distress and an increase in the prevalence of depressive symptoms among some. Some studies also underlined loneliness as a particular mental health issue among older people and reported loneliness as a prevalent mental health hazard that undermines older people's well-being and life quality during the pandemic. Looking further afield, we also know that the mental health impact of the pandemic on older people differs across different countries as the severity and policies of COVID-19 vary. The impact also varies across different social groups along the lines such as socioeconomic status, deprivation, and pre-pandemic mental and physical health. Bring together those two trends we discussed just now, I worked with Dr. Rhea Chen from the University of British Columbia in Canada, and we asked the following two questions. First, what is the relationship between older people's interaction with families and friends who do not live with them and their mental health during COVID-19? Secondly, does the relationship differ between in-person and virtual interactions? In other words, has the rapid digitalization made up for a lack of in-person interactions for older people? If you're interest, interested in reading further about our research, it's published to open access and you can find it following the address on the screen. Before going to our results, just a quick note on what we did in our research. Thanks to the high quality and valuable data from Understanding Society and the Health and Retirement Survey in the USA, our research was comparative in scope between the UK and the USA. We thought the comparison interesting and worthwhile because at the time of the study, June 2020, household-centered pandemic responses was more closely implemented in the UK than in the USA. And specifically, we fo focus on older adults aged 60 or over in the two countries. General mental health was captured by the GHQ scales in the UK and highly comparable CESD scales in the USA. We also measured older people's self-perceived loneliness. Notably, we looked at both mental health during the pandemic and changes from before. We further controlled for a range of social demographic characteristics, such as age, gender, ethnicity, education, migrant status, living alone, work and employment, COVID, symptoms and infection, general health and financial well-being. And we did also test for a wider range of controls in our earlier research. And here are our results. The yellow bars in the graphs show the distribution of the older people's general mental health in the UK and the USA during the pandemic. We are a higher score, uh, before the pandemic, excuse me, we are a higher score indicates a greater level of mental distress. So we would like to see lower scores for mental, better mental health. Then the holo bars depict the older people's mental health during the pandemic. Our findings show that there has not been an overall decline in older people's mental health in the USA, but a decline is noted in the UK, primarily in the decreasing proportion of older people who did not have any mental health issues. When it comes to loneliness, the opposite is observed between the UK and the USA. The rate of loneliness was higher in the USA than in the UK, where 37% of older people reported that they felt lonely sometimes during the pandemic, and another 6.4% reported having felt lonely often. In the UK, by contrast, about one in four older people felt lonely sometimes during COVID, and another 5% felt lonely often. That means altogether around 30% of older people reported feeling lonely during COVID in the UK. Have the elderly became more lonely during COVID than before? Our findings show that there has not been an overall increase in loneliness in the UK, as the proportions of older adults who have become lonelier as opposed to less lonely are more or less equal. In contrast, as many as 30% of American elderly became lonelier 
during the pandemic than before. What about older people's interactions with their non-residential families and friends, both in-person and via virtual means? The left graph depicts in-person contact, hollow black bars for the UK and the yellow bars for the USA. We see that in-person contact was more or less normally distributed in the USA, but many older people in the UK tend to have limited in-person contact with non-cohabiting family members and friends during this time. The graph on the right depicts the frequency of virtual contact. As we can see, older people in the UK were skewed towards more frequent virtual contact during the pandemic, and this could be because of two potential reasons. On the one hand, household restrictions and lockdowns were more strictly implemented in the UK than in the USA at the time of the survey. And on the other hand, the UK respondents were surveyed mostly online, which means they already have access to and know how to use the internet, while the American respondents were surveyed through a postal sample. And that will come back to this implication of the survey mode difference in just a moment. Now the graphs on the screen show how in-person and virtual contact related to older people's mental health on the left and changes in mental health from before on the right. In both graphs, a higher score indicates worse mental health, so we are looking for a negative and lower score for better mental health. As we can see, frequent in-person contact was associated with better general mental health in both countries. And in the UK, frequent in-person contact was also associated with an improvement in mental health from before the pandemic. But when it comes to virtual contact, Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, social media, texting, and so on, as captured by the yellow bars, they are associated with neither older people's mental health during the pandemic, nor mental health changes from before. Bearing in mind, that the UK sample included only older people from an online survey who have access to and know how to use digital technology, they do not seem to have benefited from virtual interactions any more than their American counterparts. The mental health benefits of in-person contact is also found in older people's loneliness. We found that particularly in the USA, to a lesser extent, but still in the UK, Frequent face-to-face -face contact was associated with less loneliness and less increasing loneliness. Frequent virtual interactions, however, is associated with more loneliness in the USA and an increase in loneliness in both countries. Our statistical results, based on cross-sectional analysis to some extent, do not reveal the causal mechanism between virtual contact and mental well-being. But two possible mechanisms may be at play here. When we embarked on this piece of research, my collaborator and I did not set out to identify the causal mechanisms. After our research has been covered by media outlets such as the BBC, The Guardian, and CNN, we received quite some correspondences from the readers some thanking us for having spoken right to their struggles and others sharing their stories and experiences. These qualitative narratives have helped shed further light on the mechanisms underpinning our findings. On the one hand, the association between frequent virtual interactions and greater loneliness could be because virtual contact indeed leads to a greater sense of loneliness and mental distress. One of our readers described how seeing family on screen reminded them of what they have missed out, which made them even sadder. And another reader expressed the frustration at constantly being told that get onto Skype and Facebook and you'll be all right, and struggling to come into terms with digital technology. And others have told us about their burnout from an unprecedented amount of screen time. On the other hand, the association we observed could be a result of reverse causality. That is, older people who felt lonely may be more likely to connect with or reach out to their families and friends online. In either case, however, 
it is clear that virtual contact did little to help improve older people's mental health during the pandemic. Of course, virtual and in-person interactions are often used in combination with each other. That's why in our analysis, we also examined how distinct combinations of the two related to older people's mental health. Not surprisingly, first of all, older people are least likely to experience mental distress and loneliness when they had frequent contact with non-residential families and friends in both virtual and in-person modes. When they had frequent face-to-face -face contact, but infrequent virtual contact, their mental health is still very good, though not the best. When the older people had only frequent virtual contact, but limited in-person contact, they were most likely to suffer from loneliness, an increasing loneliness, mental distress, and an increase in mental distress, more so than if both their in-person and virtual interactions were limited. These results, we think, have important implications for thinking about digitalization and aging and mental health. If COVID-19 enacted a mass digital experiment on the aging population, then the results of our experiment tells us that the virtual only future may have limited promise as virtual only contact is not found to be helpful in sustaining older people's mental health. However, when virtual contact is used in conjunction with in-person contact, it seems to bring about small additional benefits over and above in-person interactions. This points to a promise of a digitally enhanced but not replaced the future of aging. As we look back at the first two years of COVID-19 and look beyond it, what can we learn from our research findings? Our findings, first of all, highlight the pressing need for policies, public health interventions, and actions from us all to understand and mitigate the cascading mental health impact of the pandemic and its associated responses on older people. In designing our responses to the pandemic and future crises of this kind, despite the priority of physical health, it is equally important to account for the mental well-being of the aging population. And secondly, interacting with families and friends was taken for granted before the pandemic. But it's only until it has been taken away from us during the pandemic do we more fully realize and appreciate it as a valuable mental health resource. Therefore, future public health campaigns should make efforts to build resilient inter-household bonds. Our findings, as briefly discussed just now, show the promise of a digitally enhanced but not replaced future for aging and for the aging population. As we build this digitally enhanced future, it is crucial to ensure equitable access to an affordance of digital technology and to develop older people's capacity to use such technology so that they benefit from it rather than suffer from or become stressed out about it. Accommodating age inclusive needs should also be a key priority in the design and delivery of digital health platforms and communication tools. Finally, in order to learn from the pandemic, we need robust evidence to inform policymaking changes and intervention. Resource such as the Understanding Society data has proven invaluable in this process. Thank you for your attention and for inviting me to present at the Insight event today. I look forward to our discussion.